Okay, so one of the consequences of the way in which um, the rules for indirect, indirect sentences or embedded sentences work in Greek is that you it creates a problem because the rule uh, is that you determine the, f uh, the aspect of the participle, which is the verb if you have an accusative and participle construction, of the infinitive, um, which has, or the infinitives only have aspect, or of the indicative and the optative in the haughty construction, is that you, you have the option of preserving the form of the original sentence, okay? An embedded sentence is a sentence that was originally not embedded, okay? Right. So in order to determine what the correct syntax is, you have to go back to the, its unembedded form and what the Greek uh, uh, syntax rules say or imply is that you're preserving in some way the original um, aspect of the verb. Okay, aspect can get you pretty far. It leaves out the possibility of tense. But what happens in Greek is that this syntax is very, very popular. We use it all the time in Greek. You do it in English. But what, what's unacceptable uh, is that, and what, what causes a problem in Greek, is that if your ver the verb of your embedded sentence is the future, mm -hmm. okay, um, when, it's, when you want to put it in the optative, or when you want to use the infinitive, okay, um, or you want to use a participle for that matter, what do you do? Well, with a participle, we have the future participle, which is originally only, uh, um, only um, modal. In other words, originally meant intending to do something, and it should be used only for that purpose, to express purpose, right? right. Um, but you can use the future participle, and this, I think, is the key to the whole way this thing developed, in, a, in an embedded sentence, when you are, the sentence you are uh, embedding originally was in the future. So if you wanted to say something weird like, I see that you will be a cowboy, okay, you could use the future participle of the verb to be, which is esomenos, okay? So then you would say, you want to write this out? Haro se bukalon esomenon. Okay. I see that you will be a cowboy. Okay. Um, it's a weird idea, but the, the syntax is what we're talking about, which doesn't have to do with meaning necessarily. Okay. Um, but what happens when you're talking about uh, the haughty construction or an infinitive, right? Um, construction like with nomizo. Well, well, what happens is that. Greek, as it, it, it originally inherited a, a future participle that expressed purpose, so it inherited a future infinitive that also expressed a desire. So that, this is the only place in which, or one of the few places, there, there are some other places in which the future infinitive survived with nomizo. So you'd say nomizo se, um, and then you'd say the future infinitive, which um, is not a form that we learned, but if you had to guess it, you would. It's SS thigh for SMI, okay? So you use the future stem, the SE stem, because infinitives have a thematic vowel E, and, and uh, as opposed to uh, participles that have the O, okay? And you add the thigh, the middle infinitive ending. So, in fact, we haven't learned this at all, but there's a whole bunch of future infinitives. Every verb that we've learned has a future infinitive. And it's the same as the present infinitive for regular verbs, except there's an S before the E. So the future infinitive of, of uh, luo is lusain, not luain, but lusain. Um, the future infinitive of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, what else? Mm. <laughs> um, I, that's analogous to every single verb that we've had, okay? So we, we got a middle and one up there in SS thigh. You could do um would be for besas thigh and so for besas thigh and so forth. For basis thigh rather. For bit with an eta. That's right. All right. For basis thigh. Um to give you another middle infinitive, okay? So there's a middle and uh and there's even a future passive infinitive. Lu thesis thigh. Uh, I'll put it over here. Yep. Lu thesis thigh. 
exactly okay that, that's to be released okay mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing magical or weird about these constructions they're just you have the future suffix which is the s um, and added to the infinitive endings okay um, what happens when you want to use a hottie construction with an optative after a secondary verb of saying like lego okay well what greek does is something very weird that is, it invents a future optative, okay? Um, so so in, a, in, in essence, optative should not be future, okay? Because they don't have tense. But in order to preserve the, a future in an original sentence, Greek developed this future optative, which is non-aspectual, in order to reflect it in an embedded sentence. So let's go back to our original. We'd say lego, haughty, or, well, we have to say Alexa. Let's let's do that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. A, the aorist form. I said Alexa, haughty or host, um, that. Um, and then we're going to say um, um, you will be in the future optative, which is going to be Essoya. Okay. Like yes. that. S middle, yes. middle okay. form, uh, bukalos. So that's going to mean I said that you were a cowboy. Okay, there's the future optative of the verb to be. What a weird idea! All right. Um, there's one last thing about this syntax for indirect sentence and its consequences, and that is that what do you do? You may wonder what do you do if you have say a purpose clause then inside an embedded sentence with a subjunctive or an optative. And the rule is you stick to what you had in the embedded sentence. Okay, you can preserve the subjunctive if, if that's what was there. Um, you can keep it in the optative if it was optative. Okay, so so we don't have to worry about that. All right? Good to know. That's it.